Hola amigos! In today's video, we're going to revisit using Niagara and Skeletal Meshes together to make this fun effect that can turn any character into a voxel version of itself. The effect can be configured to change the density of the grid and the downsampling of the mesh textures, and will include a transition between the original geometry and the voxelized version. As a bonus, we'll set it up so the voxels can detach from the model whenever we want. And you could use this in-game as some kind of de-res ability or attack, or any other effect that requires a character to disappear, like a teleport, for example. So without further ado, let's get started. Here's my setup. I'm using the same scene from the last few tutorials, but I swapped the character mesh and animations for something that I thought it was visually more interesting than the default mannequins from the third-person template. I downloaded all these assets from Mixamo.com, there's a link on the description below. Now we can create a new Niagara system and use selected emitters, next, and let's add the empty template. We'll do everything from almost scratch. Now we can give this a name, Niagara system tutorial voxel, for example. And before we go into the system itself, let's add it to the character as a component. And to avoid um, renaming the component and adding it later, we can select it here on the content browser, then select the mesh, click add in Niagara particle system component, and as you can see, it auto populates the name and it auto selects it here as the Niagara system asset. Just pretty convenient. Now we can double click on it and let's start making changes to this system. Before we start adding modules, let's change the stuff that we already have on the emitter. I'm going to start with a name, so change it from empty to something like voxel. And on the properties, I'm going to change the sim target from CPU to be an EPU sim, so we can have tons of particles without any problems in performance. And we have a warning here about dynamic bounds, so let's change it to fixed. And we can always increase this size later if we have problems with visibility. Next, on the emitter state, let's change the lifecycle mode to self and the loop behavior to once. We only need to run the emitter one time. And finally, on the particle state, let's uncheck kill particles when lifetime has elapsed. So our particles keep alive forever. Perfect. Now we can save it. And we're going to start by sampling this skeletal mesh. You might remember this part from previous tutorials. There's two modules of interest to us here. The first one on the emitter update stage is sample skeletal mesh. The other one on the particle update is uh, skeletal mesh location. So we can add both and we can see that immediately that they have both have warnings. And these warnings are all about not having a mesh here to represent. So let's change the source mode to attach parent. So the system will use whatever mesh is attached to. And let's change the preview mesh to the same monster that I'm using outside. So cloud monster. Now let's make the same changes here on skeletal mesh location. So source mode, attach parent, and preview mesh, whatever mesh you're using. Perfect, and we still don't have any particles, and it's because we're not spawning any. So on the emit update, let's add a spawn burst instantaneous. And now we have one particle, which could be our monster, but who knows. So let's increase this spawn count to uh, maybe like a thousand. And we have a blob that vaguely resembles a humanoid. So let's go to initialize particle module and reduce the sprite size mode. Uh, let's change it to uniform and change the size to maybe like one. Now this kind of resembles our monster, but not really. And it's because we are right now sampling only the bones of the skeletal mesh. So let's change this mode from bones random here in the mesh sampling type, from skeleton bones to surface triangles. And we have to do the same here. 
And as you can see, we have a new warning now. It says CPU access error. And that's because this mesh needs exactly that, CPU access. And we can go into the mesh and change the property manually, but we can also click this fix now button and let Unreal do it for us. And if you do that, as you can see now, our sample is sticking to the surface of the mesh, not the bones. Perfect. We're partially there. Let's change the sprite renderer for something more interesting and more voxel-like. First, I'm going to remove the sprite renderer and replace it with a mesh renderer. And we can see these gizmos called Nomon that if we go to the mesh renderer and meshes, we can replace. And the editor already has a cube called SM underscore cube that only has 24 vertices and 12 triangles, which will be perfect for this use. And immediately we see the Kraken, but if we zoom out, it's just that our cubes are massive. So we can go to the initialize particle module, and I want to unset this price size, we're not using that anymore. And on mesh scale mode, I'm going to change it to uniform and change the mesh size to maybe like 0.1. Cool. Now we have something that is a bit more voxel-like, but I wouldn't call these voxels. The cubes are all misaligned and they're not distributed on a grid. So let's change the orientation part first. That one will be easier. So we can go to the skeletal mesh location module here and change the orientation sampling from apply to output. Cool. And now our cubes are aligned to the grid, but they're not still distributed correctly. And to fix that, we'll use a custom expression and a little bit of code. Let's go to the particle update and add a set new or existing parameter directly. And inside the module, click the little plus icon and search for particles position. Here it is. And as you can see, all our particles are condensed in one point, which is the origin of the entire simulation. And that's because the default value here is engine emitter simulation position. We'll change that in a moment, but first I want to define the size of whatever grid we want to use. And I'll do that using a user parameter. So add a new float value here and change the name to something like grid size or something like that. And for now, let's take a value of 10. Now let's use this. And we could do this using a stack of operations, but I'm going to do it I think a bit more elegantly using a new expression. And we can remove all this. And basically we want to take the position of the particles, so particles.position. And first I want to divide it by this grid size. So divided by user.grid size. Now let's think about it for a moment. If we had particles, let's say at 10, 15 and 20 units and our grid size was 10 after this operation we could say that the first particle is at position 1 of the grid and the third one is at position 2 but that one that is in the middle at 15 units after dividing this it will give us a value of 1.5 and that's exactly what we don't want so let's round this value or we can use a truncate or a floor but I'm going to use a round and now that will give us the exact or the rounded grid position. Now we need to multiply this again by the grid size. So let's take this parenthesis and times user grid size. And here we have our Minecraft looking version of our monster. And here's the final code for this expression round of particles position divided by user grid size times user grid size. Perfect. Now the next thing that I want to change is to find a relationship between the size of the particles and the grid size. Because if you, let's say we change the grid size to 5. 
Well, now we start to have some weird intersections and, and problems. And especially if we say to something like four. Now our grid is not aligned, which again could be a cool effect if you're looking for this, but I want a perfect grid. So if I set the, the grid size to four, I would probably need to do this and now our grid is perfectly aligned again. And so in this case, the scale of the mesh is the grid size divided by 100. And we could maybe get a, a slightly different effect like this. We could also increase this, the number of particles, let's say 5,000. But again, I don't want the gaps between the grid spaces, so I'm going to change this to be this number, the grid size, divided by 100. So again, we'll do that with an expression and say that this is user.grid size divided by 100. And now it doesn't matter what size of the grid we have, the particles will always align correctly. So. Cool, we're almost there, I'd say. We just need to fix the colors and then figure out how we're going to do the transition between both the states. Let's do the color first. For that, we're going to need a new material. So let's call this material. Oh. Material. Um, and let's search here for mesh and check the box used with mesh particles. And for now, we'll just make it the simplest material. So let's take the particle color and connect the RGB to base color. And that's it for now. We can hit apply and save. And let's apply it to the mesh. To replace the material, we just need to go to the mesh renderer and click the enable material overrides checkbox. Now we can add one material override and either select the material here or we can drag and drop it from the content browser. Perfect. Our model is white because we are not overriding the particle color property yet. But let's do that with a sample texture model. So add a sample texture and make sure that it's after the skeletal mesh location module because we're going to use data from here. Now, for the texture, I know that my model is going to use the mutant diffuse texture, so I'll select that. And for the UVs, just search for sample, and we have basically two that we can use, the emitter or the particles. However, the emitter is just the initial value, so make sure that you select this one, the particles, skeletal mesh location, sample UV. And well, now our model is color and voxelized and the voxels are aligned, but there is still a bunch of flickering and we'll address that in a moment. But for now, let's check it out in runtime. Okay, let's try this. Yeah, our character is voxelized, but seeing the original mesh underneath makes it a bit hard to see. Now, you might be tempted to just I have it open. Yeah, here. You might be tempted to just uh, go here and click on the mesh and check the visible checkbox. However, if you just do that, uh, there is an issue here. And what's happening is that the Niagara system now doesn't have a mesh to scan. So making it invisible, or invisible, sorry, uh, in this case, and because of optimizations, it's also making it kind of unreadable for other parts of the of the of the system. 
So let's go back to making it visible. And instead, we'll go to the render settings. And here we are. So I'm going to uncheck visible in main pass and also render in dead pass. And if you were using ray tracing, you might also make it invisible in ray tracing. In reflections as well. Again, based on your project needs. Now let's go back. And now we don't have a character, but the shadow is not the shadow from the particles. So let's do that next. So if we search for shadow, disable the shadow on the mess and enable the shadow on the particles. And let's try one more time. Perfect. Now our shadow looks like voxels and our mesh looks like voxels and the original mesh of the character is gone. Perfect. Now we need to address the flickering. Okay, let me stop this. So the flickering happens because we're still sampling the texture in a continuous way where we need discrete values, just as we're doing for the positions. Imagine it's something like aligning the texture colors into a grid. So for each space of the grid, space of the grid we just get the first color that we find. So we'll do that here on the sample texture module. I'm going to change the UV for an expression. And, and this is a bit more complicated, so give me a second to type it out, and then I will show it in a fresh notepad so it's easier to copy. And this is the final expression I used. I'll paste it in, in a wordpad in a moment. But I also created a new parameter float value called texture grid size, which I'm using here. Okay, paste this and this is the code and it will be easier to understand if I organize it in a little different way. Uh, maybe like this, maybe with the comma here, yeah, like that. So since we're working in UV coordinates, we need to make a flow too. And we're repeating the same operation that we did earlier with the positions. But instead of using the particle position, in this case, we're using the particle sample skeletal mesh location or skeletal mesh location sample UV. And we're separating that into the X and Y components. So for X, we're doing the sample UV dot X divided by the texture grid size, then rounded, and then multiplied by the texture grid size. And same thing for the Y coordinate. Now you can see the effect if I adjust this. So we have right now a 0 0.01 value, which keeps a good amount of detail. You can see some of the detail in the hair of this guy and some of it in the face, but let's say increase it to 0 0.1. That means that now our texture only has 10 colors by 10 colors distributed in a grid. And then we lose a bunch of detail which for a grid space of this size or grid size this small probably would be a little weird, but maybe if we increase this to maybe five or six, now you can see the colors aligning a little bit better. Now we, we can see the pants, we can see the claw and the face more or less. So it's a matter of playing with these two values and finding a good balance between both. I think that for 2.5, I make 0 0.01. I think that's this amount. And it doesn't completely eliminate the flicker, but as long as the mesh doesn't move too much, it doesn't create a lot of artifacts. Let's do the transition next. So for that, what we're gonna do is make part of the mesh disappear, and at the same time, with the same ratio, make the particle effect appear. And for that, we'll need to start by making changes on the material that our character uses. So right now it's set to opaque, and I'll change that to mask. 
and let's have a new parameter here, a new scalar parameter. I will call this one a transition. And let's do a simple one by using a bounding box. So what I want to do is have a transition that goes up and down between the mesh and the particles. And this node bounding box base 01 UVW is, does exactly that. It gives you a 0 to 1 range, gradient range, based on the size of the bounding box of the object. So we can now take a step operation between these two values. So I'm going to use the Z component, which is the blue component in these outputs, and connect this to the opacity mask. And now if I increase this transition value, let's say 0.5, half, yeah, half of our sphere has disappeared. 0.75, 3 quarters, 0.9, most of it, 1, everything disappears. Excellent. And at 0, everything is visible. And well, this is a very simple transition. You could do a different axis, or if you passed a coordinate, you could do something like a radius, a radial expansion of the particle effect from a given point, maybe something like from a spell or a trap or something like that. Cool. Now hit apply and save. And next, we'll need to make some changes in our blueprint. Okay, so here I have the third person character blueprint and I haven't changed anything here. So we can add a new event. And I'm going to use a left alt, maybe. I don't think that's mapped to anything else. So we can use this and we'll need a new Boolean. We can call this is voxelizing. Voxelizing. What a word. And every time that we release alt, we'll toggle between true and false for this. So we need a get and a set. And on release, we just set this value to not the current value. Cool. Now we have a toggle. Now we can take this and use it on a branch. Make, oops, make, make some room. And let's add a timeline here. We can call this uh, timeline transition. And on true, we'll play it forward. And on false, we'll reverse it. Now double click on the transition to edit it. And I want to change the time to 10 seconds and add a float track. We can call transition. And we'll need two keys. So the first one will go on 0, 0. And the second one will go on time 10, value 1. Excellent. Now going back to the graph, we can apply this to our material. So we can drag the mesh here and start typing scalar. And we have the set scalar parameter value on materials. So every time that the transition timeline uh, ticks, well, update this material value with the transition track and the material name that we created earlier was also called transition. Now before we can see this uh, effect on the character we need to make it visible again for a moment. So let's enable again the rendering main pass and let's hide the particle system just for now. Compile and save, and let's see if this works. Sweet. Now we can also reverse it mid time. We don't need to wait for it to finish. But I think I forgot to add back the shadow. So let's enable this guy as a shadow caster again so we can see if the shadow updates. It's opacity, which it should. Yeah, and we can see how it's fading away. Excellent. Now we need to just 
use this transition track timeline that we created and apply that to the visibility of the particles somehow. I'm back in the third person character blueprint and we're going to reuse this transition track that we created to pass the value to Niagara. But instead of just passing the alpha from 0 to 1, let's pass the absolute world coordinate where the particles should or shouldn't be visible. So let's take the mesh and get the component bounding box. So component bounds. And this gives us basically a bounding box of this object in two vectors, the origin and the side or half of the length of each side. So let's break these two. And here I'm going to subtract one from the other. I'm using the component, the Z component, because it's the same thing that I did on the material. And here I'm going to add it. So we have the center minus the side and the center plus the side. So it will be the bottom part of our bottom object and the top part of our object. And now we just need to interpolate between both. So from bottom to top, using our transition as alpha. And now we have a value here that represents basically the height in world space at which the effect is currently. And let's pass it over to Niagara. Let's drag this Niagara component and set Niagara variable float. And we can connect this here and we will solve for the slurp here. And we don't have any variable to use yet, but I'm going to still create it and call it something like um, transition line. And copy this because I'm going to use it in just a moment. And let's compile and save and go back to our particle system. We'll need to create a new float value and we can paste the name transition line so it matches the one on the blueprint. And let's use this. And we want to change the opacity of this particle, right? So we can do that with a scale color. However, everything turns white. So we don't need to scale the RGB, only the alpha, and also not the particle's initial color, but the one that we sample. So let's search for sample texture, again, the one on the particles. And now, if we change the alpha to zero, you would expect these particles to disappear, however, they are still there. And it's because we are still not using the alpha on the material. So I'll go to the mesh renderer and double click on the material and let's connect. Let's first change the blend mode to mask and then connect the alpha to the opacity mask. Now hit apply and save. And now we'll go back to our scale color. Now our particles disappear with an alpha of zero. Perfect. However, we want to use this transition line. So let's do that and do this in an expression. And this one will be pretty simple. We just want to do, let's say, the step of particles dot position dot z comma user dot transition line. Perfect. Um, you can see that we have a little gap there. We might need to change the transition line to start at minus one on the graph. So let's compile and save. And let's go here to the timeline, sorry, and change this initial value to minus one. Or, sorry, minus one. 0.1. And now, if we press play, we have our creature, its well defined shadow. And if we press Alt, oh, oh yeah, I didn't make the particles visible. Sorry about that. Let's 
let's go to a third person character, select the particles and make them visible again. So file and more save. And now it should work. Let's see. Great. And we can always speed up or slow down the effect by changing the values on the timeline and change the parameters on the on the graph. However, and you might have noticed this one. What's happening here is that okay, let me show my mouse. Right now the height at which particles are not being seen is the end of the transition line, which we calculated according to the bounding box. However, now we're not updating the timeline, so the bounding box is not updating anymore, which means that the height of the particles is still this line here. And if we jump, now anything above that line disappears. Let's fix that next. So I can go to the character and we'll do that on the graph. And let me organize this with a few comments and be right back. Hopefully the graph is a bit more clear and easier to read now. And to fix the problem with the bounding box, the easiest thing would be to disconnect this Niagara variable update from the timeline update and connect this to a new event tick. And that means we will update the bounding box every frame instead of just when the timeline is running. And to be a bit more optimal, we would do this only when the character is moving or when it's jumping or something like that. And for this example, this should be fine. So let's give it a try and activate the effect. And transition is happening. Let's wait for it to finish. And I can jump now and move up and down and the effect doesn't disappear. Excellent. I think the last thing that I want to add is um, some controlled effect also to make the particles fall and disperse or, or explode in some ways. And we'll do that next. In a similar way to what we did for the material transition, we're going to use the blueprint to control this new effect. So add a new boolean, we'll call it uh, particle physics enabled. We can actually copy this name and use it a couple times. And let's do the same as here. Let's first a get and then a set. And a not boolean. So every time that we press a key, it will toggle between true and false. And let's set this one to uh, left control on release. And after it change, we'll pass that value to Niagara. So we can use the set Niagara variable, boo, and connect this to the set and the value here. And we'll use the same variable name, particle physics enable, that's okay compile and save and go to our particle system. Now first thing that we want to do here is to add a boolean and we can reduce the same name particle physics enabled and let's just start making use of that. Let's add a few of the modules that use physics to this particle update stage. I'm going to keep things simple and maybe add a gravity force then we'll need to click this fix issue to how to add the solve forces and velocity. And I'm going to move the set position after that one. And let's say we can add also a drag and maybe a curl noise force. Maybe this one, maybe 500, and let's say 20 or 15 would probably be okay. And yeah, we can also add a collision change it to distance fields, work really well. 
and let's link this to the particle physics enable boolean so to do that we can go to the solve forces and velocity and click here to expand this view and show these parameters and i'm going to uncheck the right to resolve properties because it cannot be dynamically linked and for this one i'm going to drag the particle physics enabled and link it here so solve forces and velocity only gets applied when this checkbox is done and you can see that when it's on our character goes down a little bit the gravity compresses it it's kind of funny but what's happening is that this effect is fighting against this skeletal mesh location and to correct that here we have this right to particle position so we want the opposite of the solve force of velocity we want to right to this position only when this is not enabled so let's add a boolean not boolean not operation and drag this bool to link it or link drag this parameter to link it to this property and now it goes away really fast but really it's it's falling down Okay, so I think we're ready to try. I want to also maybe inherit a little bit of the velocity. So here on velocity sampling, I'm going to change it from output to apply. And then instead of having a constant value, I'm going to actually set make a custom float from bool. So again, we can drag this and connect it, link it here. To this bool property and for true i don't want to inherit the whole velocity maybe half of it and i want to have a low speed limit so maybe 50 yeah it's probably fine now we can save and compile and we're ready to try let's try this one more time transform and then go on top of this platform so we get a good view of our mutant monster and if everything works as it should, once I press control, this guy should fall into a pile of voxels, just like this, delicious, delicious voxels. And we can toggle this on and off. And because we are inheriting some of the velocity, it will go in that direction if he's walking or falling or something. And because we're not stopping the character controller, we still have some control, which I don't know, I think it's pretty funny just smear him in this direction or something like that and we could keep improving this effect by adding things like i don't know a glowing transition between the mesh and the voxels or a change in the in the density of the grid over time as the effect goes so to keep getting more and more pixelated and things like that but if you were able to follow this far I'm sure you can take this effect one or two steps further and that's all for this tutorial if you enjoy this content please leave a comment and consider subscribing and clicking that notification button if you want more of this see you next time